Again, and just a reminder that these prayers are really just about aligning ourselves uh, with uh, the Buddha, his teachings, so that we become more receptive to these teachings and are able to achieve realizations. So this praise to Shakyamuni Buddha that we're going to do on page 73, we'll recite this three times. But again, it's not that the Buddha is sitting there waiting for our praise. This is about our seeing the, qual the qualities of the Buddha, admiring those, and uh, wishing to become just like the Buddha through our own practice. So let's recite this together three times. To the founder, the endowed, transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan. I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. Then turn the page, and on 75, we'll continue with the second full verse there, continuing to pay homage, and then recalling some of the Buddha's basic teachings that we always want to abide by. Homage to the Supreme Buddha. Homage to the Dharma refuge. Homage to the great Sangha. To all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms in all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions, perform only perfect virtuous actions, subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha, a star, a visual aberration, a flame of a lamp, an illusion, a drop of dew or a bubble, a dream, a flash of lightning, a cloud. See conditioned things as such. Through these merits may sentient beings attain the rank of all seeing, subdue the foe of faults, and be delivered from samsara's ocean, perturbed by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. Then go forward to page either 97 or 98, depending on which version of the prayer book you have. There'll be a prayer either at the bottom of 97 or the top of 98, the short mandala offering prayer. We're going to recite just that single verse in English and then jump uh, past the next, next verse to this offering mantra. And then we go continuing on the bottom of 98 to the refuge in bodhicitta prayer, which we'll do once in English and twice in Tibetan. So if you're not familiar with this mandala offering, it's just imagining the entire phenomenal world transformed into a beautiful paradise, whatever that means to you. Use your own imagination and then offer it to the Buddhas, to the holy beings, so you can receive the Dharma and achieve the same realizations that they have. This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon, I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. All living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam guru ratna mandala kam yami. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. 
by the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye Chodang Soki Choknam Jangchu Bar Daki Chanyan Gipe Sonam Jola Penchir Sangye Drupar Sangye Chodang Soki Choknam Ha Jangchu Bardu Dakni Kyabsuchi Daki Chanyan Gipe Sonam Gi Jola Penchir Sangye Drupar Shore. You can set the prayer books aside. We'll begin with just a short meditation, give ourselves a chance to focus the mind a little, and then I'll lead you in a short reflection uh, to set our intention for being here, to make sure we have sort of the best motivation for engaging in these teachings today. So just find a good meditation posture, making sure that the back is somewhat straight, kind of an uprightness to the body, while also relaxing as best as you can, especially releasing any tension in the neck and shoulder area any other parts of the body where you find some tightness, just try to soften into those areas. When you're ready, begin to pay attention to the breath. And if you have a technique that you already use from your own practice to work with the breath, then you can do that. If not, then I generally suggest tuning into the sensation that occurs in the area of the nostrils, sometimes even on the upper lip, where you feel the air coming in and out of the nostrils. So focusing on that point, that sensation, try to stay present with it as best as you can, as you inhale, as you exhale. And in any of our meditations, when we see that the mind has wandered away from the breath, whatever technique we're using, then at that time, the job is to correct our awareness, to let go of whatever it was that distracted us, if we were getting caught up in thoughts of remembering or planning, whatever the case might be, or maybe we got distracted by sounds. Whatever has occurred, just let that go and make a conscious choice to return back to the breath, restoring your meditation once more. So I'll ring the chime and we'll do this in silence for just a few minutes. And as I said, I'll lead you in a short reflection to set a good motivation for today.
Now let's begin to set our motivation. And I thought to begin this process today, since we did just have a day of Thanksgiving, to spend a few minutes reflecting on gratefulness and begin to think about all the things in your life currently for which you are grateful. Even just having this human life as we have talked about in the last few sessions, we should be extremely grateful for this opportunity that this human life affords us. But spend a few minutes reflecting on all that you have in your life. You can feel great gratitude for it. And begin to extend this out, if you haven't already, to those who are outside of our circle who are contributing to our welfare indirectly, frequently. So we might be very grateful already for the people who are in our lives who show us incredible kindness, who care for us when we're ill or who uh, attend to us in a variety of ways. There are many people involved in your welfare, many beings in this world involved in your welfare. Try to extend the gratitude out to all of those for what they do that contributes to your welfare. People who grow the food that you eat, who package it, who ship it, who sell it, who prepare it. Even the insects involved in the food that we eat Think about all the other things that you possess that you have some use for that are through the kindness of others who build the cars that you drive, you know, construct the roads that you drive upon, the buildings that you go to, the house that you live in. So many beings have been involved in your welfare. Is it possible to extend our gratitude to each and every one of them? Although we don't know them, we can feel grateful that they have contributed to our welfare. And is it possible to even extend our gratitude out to those beings who are very difficult and challenging for us? While they may have harmed us or done things that we oppose, they're an incredible source of practice for us. We have to learn tolerance from the intolerant, patience from the impatient, kindness from those who are unkind. Sometimes these difficult people can be our greatest teachers. Is it possible to have some gratitude, some gratefulness in your own heart right now for the difficult people that you've encountered in this life those that you are dealing with even at this current time. And then out of the, this sense of gratitude, recognize that it's important that we make use of all that we have then, all the kindness we've been shown by others, all the things that we possess that put us in a most optimal position to be able to use this life meaningfully, we then have to make a commitment to doing that. And the greatest purpose, as we've been discussing in these Sunday teachings, uh, the great meaning that Rinpoche is directing us towards through this practice, is to dedicate our lives to the welfare of others, to cherish others as much as we currently cherish ourselves. <laughs> to be able to see others 
as wish fulfilling for ourselves because it's through others that we actually do have all the goodness in our lives all the way up through our own enlightenment. So in this way, we dedicate ourselves to achieving that state that we call Buddhahood or enlightenment, that state that we each have the potential to achieve, not for our own welfare, but so that we can be ideally suited to help others to achieve the same goal. So out of that space of great gratefulness, gratitude, open up to that sincere wish, that sincere desire to help all sentient beings to find the happiness that they seek, to be free from all suffering and dissatisfaction. And think that you're going to engage in these teachings again today so that you can accomplish a state of Buddhahood to be able to do that. Okay, good. So I think everyone has noticed the copies were distributed today and some of you may already have a copy of that practice that you have for your own, then you can just set those aside. But uh, we've been using this practice since I returned uh, at the beginning of no November, um, going through it slowly and following some of Lama Zopa's advice as well as just teachings I've been giving on this uh, uh, text. This is something again that Lama Zopa Rinpoche composed, well he didn't compose it all, he gathered it from various sources and put together in his own instructions how to, how to actually start your day with this practice. So again, you're welcome to take your copy with you and to begin to use it at home. Um, we're on page seven, uh, just to get us into this. This is the first part of this. This whole thing is called the method to transform a suffering life into happiness, including enlightenment. And so as Rinpoche says there, begin your day with this practice. Uh, it begins with a direct meditation on the graduated path, what we call the Lam Rim. Again, in Tibetan, that means path of, great, of stages or uh, gradual path. Um, it's the main sort of format for looking at the Buddha's teachings in this tradition. And so it contains all the important meanings. Uh, this is by this Tibetan author, Dorje Chang Losang Jimpa. And so it was composed as a way of doing kind of a glance meditation on all the main points of the Lam Rim to kind of remind ourselves of everything that's involved. So what I've been doing uh, is going through each of these verses and kind of giving the backup teachings, what should be in your mind as you recite this, because it's important that there be some meaning behind these words. So let's go ahead and recite um, maybe the first three verses up to that first verse, through that first verse on the top of page eight. Essence encompassing all the Buddhas, originator of all the holy dharma of scripture and realization, principle of all the Aryas intending virtue, in the glorious holy gurus I take refuge. Please, gurus, bless my mind to become dharma, dharma to become the path, and the path to be without obstacles. Until I achieve Buddhahood, Please bless me to be like youthful Narsang and Bodhisattva always crying, in correctly following the virtuous friend with pure thought and action, seeing whatever is done as pure and accomplishing whatever is said and advised. So then in the italics just below that, it says this is how to correctly follow the virtuous friend, the root of the path to full enlightenment. So we've gone through that topic. I'm not going to go into it again in great depth. But in this tradition, we definitely see our gurus, our lamas, those with whom we ourselves have formed a special relationship, such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama or Lama Zopa Rinpoche, who's to uh, the right of His Holiness up above, who put together this practice. You know, if we have that special relationship with them, we want to rely on them greatly, trying to follow all of their advice as best as we can, uh, to try to see them in the most optimal way, to focus on their qualities you know, to try to use their qualities as a mirror to reflect what we have the potential to achieve ourselves. So this is the very root of the path um, and presented in those few verses. Then we went through the next one, which is kind of the beginning of our stages of the path. After having the introductory topic of relying upon the guru, we then look at what's called here the graduated path of the lower capable being, meaning that our first intention is to try to use this life you know, out of that space of gratitude that we meditated on, use this life at least to gain a good rebirth. 
And again, in Buddhism, we have that acceptance of this idea of, of rebirth that we can maybe use as a, um, a template for how we are looking at existence and what it's about, that due to the continuity of mind, that consciousness has no beginning because uh, every moment of consciousness is preceded by another. So we can never find a beginning to all of our rebirths and our mind will go on uh, to future rebirths uh, at the end of this life. So we have to have some tending to that in this human rebirth that we currently possess. So let's recite that verse and then I'll just talk briefly about it a little, little bit more. Please bless me to see that this greatly meaningful body with freedoms and richnesses is difficult to find and easily perishes, that action and result are so profound, and that the sufferings of the evil gone transmigratory beings are so difficult to bear. Therefore, please bless me to take refuge from the depths of my heart in the three rare sublime ones, to abandon negative karma and to accomplish virtue according to dharma. So this was the main verse that we went through last week and we got into a bit of a discussion on karma. Karma is a big topic as it, you know, says in this last line, we have to try to follow this rule of karma. We even talked about that in the very first prayers that we did before class was this idea of trying not to commit non-virtuous actions, engage in only virtuous actions. This is the means by which we can accomplish a good rebirth. But we have to understand all the teachings that support that. First of all, identifying that we are in this current you know, state that's really optimal. As it says there, this greatly meaningful body with freedoms and richnesses. This human life did not come about through you know, no causes and conditions. It had its causes and conditions. We all created those in our past lives that ripen into this future, this current life that we have now. This current life, as we can see, you know, we can listen to teachings, we can meditate, we can improve the quality of our minds. Uh, we don't have that leisure if we're in an unfortunate state, if we're in one of these evil gone transmigratory being states. Um, these are again taught in the traditional teachings as constituting, uh, consisting of um, three different rebirths a rebirth in a great suffering realm that was kind of comparable to a hell realm, a rebirth as a hungry ghost where we're driven by our, our sort of desire for satisfying our basic needs and thwarted in doing that, and then rebirth as an animal. Again, we might not have any conviction in those two states that we can't readily see. We can't, they're not evident to us, but we can see what the existence of animals are like, and it's not so wonderful. We look at our, you know, the animals that live in this world, uh, their lives are, are definitely impacted by their ignorance, their inability to do anything of great import or meaning in that life, but also all the incredible suffering that those beings have to endure. Um, so again, this is uh, the contemplations that lead us into the last two lines, which are, therefore, please bless me to take refuge. Again, this is the subject of our Saturday Discovering Buddhism course, if you want to go into that in more detail. But taking refuge means finding safe direction in your life, finding what you want to rely upon in order to alleviate that fear of ending up at the end of this life, having to be uh, uncertain as to where one will go from this life. Will one's consciousness join up with another rebirth as good as this one or one that is worse than this one? It's really dependent upon our own karma. So we have to find a way of protecting ourselves from that. And that means primarily to rely upon the Dharma. There are three jewels. We're, gonna, we're going into these next Saturday in the Discovering Buddhism class. The Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Buddha are, is the Buddha himself, but also any enlightened beings, you know, any enlightened beings that we can rely upon because their knowledge is perfect. They've developed their minds to that degree. The Dharma, the teachings, and of course the main teaching that we're looking at here are the teachings on karma, because these are where we really put our refuge, is making sure that we practice these teachings well in this lifetime, so that when we get to the end of our life, we are assured that we're going to get a good rebirth. The third jewel that we rely upon in terms of refuge are the Sangha, the spiritual community. And we use that loosely to refer to everyone here involved in this center. But ideally we want to rely upon those who have greater realizations than we do. Particularly those who are Arya beings, this word Arya that came up earlier in one of the verses. It means those who've had this superior knowledge, particularly of the wisdom of emptiness, which we'll touch on a little bit today in terms of um, uh, the next stage, stage of the path uh, for the person of mid middling capability. So this is kind of the initial teachings of the stages of the path is we recognize that we're in this opportune situation, but we have to use it at least 
to gain a good rebirth, to let go of our preoccupation with all of the things of this life, all the mundane concerns that can fill our lives, literally. I mean, they can keep you from doing your Dharma practice. But to then put your attention on engaging in more virtuous actions, trying to abandon uh, what are called the 10 non-virtues, the acts of killing, stealing, uh, engaging in adultery and other uh, inappropriate sexual behavior. Those are the three of body. Then the four of speech, which are lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, and uh, idle talk, you know, meaningless chatter that we engage in quite frequently, kind of wasting our, our time with others. And then we have the three of mind, covetousness, the harmful intent, and wrong view. Again, you can read about all of those in terms of uh, any of the Lam Rim texts will go into greater detail. But essentially, we have these doorways through which we engage in unwholesome karma, creating patterns that will ripen into future suffering. Again, if you don't have any conviction in karma, that's okay for the time being, but you might try it on as Venerable Rabina, who often teaches here, as she says, you know, make it a working hypothesis for you. Be kind of a scientist. Try to live your life according to this principle of karma. And in my mind, karma makes a lot of sense because any of the other things I've heard that people put forward as to why things happen, why people have certain experiences, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You know, this is a law of cause and effect. It is embedded within the greater law of cause and effect that we see operating in the world around us. So I don't want to necessarily open up the whole can of worms that we did with karma last Sunday. Um, it's fine to get into some of these questions about you know, the karma of this and the karma of that. Um, mostly karma once more, just to emphasize before I open it up to see if there are any questions. The most important thing to emphasize is mostly has to do with your state of mind. You know, if you are engaging in an action, physically or verbally, you should be always checking out what's going on in your mind. What is your mind saying in terms of prompting you to do that behavior? And that'll be a good guide as to whether it's virtuous or non-virtuous. You know, are we speaking with kindness, compassion, concern, uh, are, or are we speaking with hostility, with um, judgment, with denigration, with criticism, whatever the case might be? So again, we have you know, a gauge in terms of what's going on with our minds. And there can be instances where we could actually use what might appear to be unskillful speech or action, but with a positive motivation. But those are very rare. I, I wouldn't you know, give kind of you know, uh, carte blanche to be able to do that, all of us in the room, because we probably don't have the cap capacity to really be quite clear in our motivation in our own minds and then have our actions, even if they might be kind of uh, harmful to others in some ways, still be quite skillful. Um, takes great knowledge and great uh, wisdom to be able to do that. That's what we got into a little bit last time. So I just wanted to put one more comment on that. But any questions on what I've talked about so far before I continue the teaching? So we did open up this next verse, and I talked about it a bit in terms of the beginning part of it um, and an understanding of what we're looking at in the first part of this second level of the stages of the path. And this is, again, as it says at the end of that one, this is the graduated path of the middle capable being. In the first level, we were still looking at our, we were looking at ourselves in terms of our own rebirth, our own state of existence. Here you are still looking at yourself. I call these first two levels of the stages of the path self-compassion. It's the greatest compassion you can have for yourself to be concerned to this degree about your own suffering. So let's read through this verse and then I'll go through uh, what I talked about a little bit uh, last time and we'll continue and finish off this verse. In dependence upon that, even if I achieve the mere higher rebirth of a deva or a human, I will still have to experience suffering endlessly in samsara because of not having abandoned and being under the control of the disturbing thought obscurations. Therefore, please bless me to reflect well upon the way of circling in samsara and to continuously follow day and night the path of the three types of precious trainings, the principal method for becoming free from samsara. So in this verse, we the very last word in that, that verse, samsara, these are the teachings on samsara that the Buddha gave, kind of delineating very clearly the situation that we're in. Samsara is usually translated as cyclic existence. It's the idea that through the force of our karma, and then of course the delusions, what's called here the disturbing thought obscurations that are below those, that are the motivation of those, 
uh, all of the karma that we create. We have been on this wheel of existence, cycling from life to life since beginningless time. Again, because the mind has that continuity and we cannot find a beginning to, to, to our minds, because mind itself is a non-material phenomenon always caused by a previous moment of mind, so that there is a prior moment of mind prior to the first moment of consciousness in this life. And there's a prior moment to that and a prior moment to that and so on, because mind is always giving rise to another moment of mind. Just as in the physical world, there's always something that is the continuity of all the physical stuff around us. Matter doesn't just disappear. It always is giving rise to something else. Well, it's the same in regard to this non-material phenomenon that we call the mind. So we have been caught up in samsara, this prison of samsara, as it's often called, since beginningless time, through the force primarily of our ignorance, which is the most um, prominent disturbing thought obscuration. It's the affliction that is at the root of all of our suffering. We then have further delusion, or we engage in even positive minds to, uh, that are together with that ignorance. We create karma that karma then causes us to have particular experiences as we saw in the previous verse. That karma is the main instrument through which we are involved in all of this. But there are deeper causes because it is a causal process. Uh, our karma doesn't arise on its own, it depends upon our mental state. Our mental states don't arise on their own, it depends upon you know, what we have been acclimated towards, what sorts of things we have been induced to think and practice and so on. So Buddhism, this is really the core teaching of Buddhism because it's really about working with your mind, much more than in the previous verse, where it's mostly about working with your behavior. Here is where we really start to take a look at what's going on in our minds. And there are three root delusions. I think I touched on these a little bit last time. But these are the three main causes of our suffering, the principal one being our ignorance. But the Buddha says that we are not aware of reality. We relate to things in a way that is fictitious, that is not in align with how they actually exist. The two things that we primarily relate to that give rise to the other two root afflictions are those things that we find really pleasant in this life and those things that we find unpleasant in this life. And on the basis of what we find pleasant, we generally generate a mind of attachment, desire, craving. You know, we go after those objects. We, we think they're so wonderful and that they're going to fulfill all of our needs and they don't actually have the capacity to do that. And we cling to them and don't want to be separated from them. But they've never satisfied. Since beginningless time, we've never found any satisfaction through following these objects of desire, these objects of attachment that induce these pleasurable feelings. On the other hand, we have those unpleasant experiences that we also relate to through the force of this ignorance in an inappropriate way. And we think that they are kind of inherently evil, inherently wrong, inherently bad, inherently unpleasant. And we push them out of our lives. And we put a lot of negative energy into that. We generate the mind of anger or aversion. Sometimes it can be elevated to the degree of hatred. So we have these two main responses that are driven by our ignorance. We're not looking at things correctly. We're not knowing them correctly. And we get triggered by those things that are pleasant and generate this deep desire and attachment for it, craving. And then we have the, the kind of revulsion, the aversion, the pushing away those things that are unpleasant in our lives. I'm not saying there aren't these two feelings. We do have pleasant feelings and unpleasant feelings. It's our reaction to those. It's our habitual way of framing those and working with those that's unhealthy. That's not grounded in reality. So essentially in these teachings, we're, we're meant to meditate, as it says in the second part, and I didn't really go into the second part quite as much, so I'll spend a little more time there this week. Please bless me to reflect well upon the way of circling in samsara, to really know what is operative in creating my own suffering. Because if we don't really understand the process well, then we just continue to step in it again and again and again and again. We don't create any of the causes to get us out of this situation, to attain the state that we call nirvana, Samsara and nirvana are these sort of two different experiences of existence. Samsara is what we have been doing since beginningless time through the force of these factors, our own karma that's motivated by our disturbing emotions, our afflictions, uh, to continue to go from life to life. Nirvana is the peace we attain when we put an end to that process once and for all. And the end is achieved 
through what's said in the, in the remaining verses, their remaining lines, and to continuously follow day and night the path of the three types of precious trainings, the principal method for becoming free from samsara. So the main way that you achieve liberation, your own individual liberation, are through the three higher trainings. So these are essentially what the Buddha would call the true path. I mean, let me give the context for all of this real quickly because I kind of skipped over that. I did go into that uh, last week. It's the context of the Four Noble Truths. In the Four Noble Truths, the first two truths, the Buddha essentially taught samsara. In the last two truths, he taught nirvana. In the first two truths, he says there is the truth of what was he called dukkha, which is this fundamental dissatisfaction that we all are experiencing as long as we're in this process. It can manifest as intense pain and difficulty at times, but it can also be the fact that we don't find anything really ultimately satisfying even in those pleasurable experiences that we have. And that's because we're in this state where we're under the control of these factors. That's the second truth, the truth of what's causing your suffering, your dukkha, your dissatisfaction. And the causes are our karma and our delusions, so these disturbing thought obscurations. The causes aren't the people out there who are saying bad things about you and doing things that you don't agree with. The cause is your own mind. Primarily, that mind gives rise to all the actions that we do through our speech, through our bodies, through our minds. So essentially, the first two truths is explaining what we saw in the first part of this. The last two truths are the fact that we can have an end to all of this. The true cessation of our dukkha, our suffering, can occur if we follow the fourth noble truth, the true path, which is where these three are presented. These three types of precious trainings are the true path to achieving liberation. Sometimes they're called the eightfold noble path in terms of the a presentation in the Pali tradition. We sometimes talk about these. I even did a course on the Eightfold Path here some years ago because they're useful to explore because they sort of pick apart these three main ideas. But essentially all of those eight fall into one of these trainings. The very first training is the training in morality. Morality here isn't the Buddha coming down from on high and giving us a tablet with 10 things that you know we have to avoid and saying, you know, don't do these because you're gonna upset me if you do. You know, it's instead, the, the understanding that we are the creators of our own suffering, our own experiences. So therefore, we have to take charge of engaging in pure morality because we want to not harm other beings as well as not harm ourselves through our own actions. So it's all rooted in the teachings of karma. It's not rooted in any kind of, you know, creation of these by some other uh, force in our, in our lives. Uh, this is just following the law of cause and effect meticulously, being uh, very vigilant and making sure that we don't engage in improper morality, improper ethical conduct. So again, that's why even in that verse that I mentioned, alluded to earlier, that was on page 74 of the prayer book, 75 of the prayer book, where it says, do not commit any non-virtuous actions, perform only perfect uh, virtuous actions. Uh, and then it goes on to say, subdue your mind thoroughly. You know, that's the remaining two trainings. The first training is encapsulated in those two verses. We want to make sure that we engage in pure behavior as much as possible. Of course, this also entails, as we develop uh, along the Buddhist path, following our vows. Those of you who have taken vows or who intend to take vows at some point, it's important that we be very uh, vigilant in assuring that we don't break those vows. But our morality is really the basis of all of our realizations. If you think about it, I mean, most of you have done meditation in the room. Imagine, you know, a time, and you probably have had a time, where you had an argument with somebody earlier in the day, and then you sit down to meditate. You know, is your mind going to be able to meditate? No, because you're probably going to be milling over what they said and what you said and how justified you were in saying what you said and all the things that happened. Or maybe you're even kind of plagued by some guilt about what you said, and then you start, you know, honing in on that, and you start feeling worse and worse about yourself because of what you said to that person. The mind is never going to settle if we don't have pure morality. Pure morality is the foundation of these trainings. In the Eightfold Path, it's talked about as being right speech, right action, and right livelihood. You know, kind of mindfully engaging in those aspects of our lives that allow us to have a good ethical relationship with others, to not be harming others, and in the process, of course, not harming ourselves as well. Now that's, again, the very first level of the stages of the path, as we're seeing, is really about mostly about ourselves. But others are harmed from your actions, you know. 
that's part of the problem you know, is that we are you know we can generally tell what is non virtuous behavior by the fact of whether it harms others or not if it does harm others it's generally non virtuous so this is the very first of the three trainings is the training in morality the next higher training is a training in concentration which means meditative stabilization, which means making the mind very focused. The beginning of class today, we did a short meditative stabilization exercise where you use the breath, however you're using the breath, as an object of focus. There are many objects you can use. In fact, my teacher in Italy, Geshe Jampi Gyatso, he said you can use anything as an object of focus in meditating and developing single-pointed concentration. But obviously, there are some objects that wouldn't be so wholesome. You don't want to do single-pointed meditation on anger, for example. That's probably not going to help your mind. Um, you don't want to do it on a, a weapon or something like that, some object that has kind of a negative tone to it. Uh, the most you know, frequent objects that we use to develop this are the breath, as well as an image of the Buddha. And in the image of the Buddha, we can use the tanka, the painting, or the statue, something to give us an idea of what we're meditating on. But we conjure it up inside our minds. It's not that you sit there and stare at a picture of the Buddha. You can do that initially to get a good idea of what's involved. But we want to try to make it more internal. This is a process that we can go into and develop um, you know, in, in great, with great capability, uh, this uh, meditative stabilization that's taught in the Buddha's teachings. Of course, keep in mind that everything that the Buddha taught came from the Hindu traditions, the Vedic traditions that already existed you know, when the, at the time of Prince Siddhartha. He left the palace, as you recall, uh, might recall from you know, knowing the Buddha's teachings, um, his life story, that at the age of 29, he became dissatisfied with existence by seeing various things that he had been blind to prior to that. And so he decided to seek liberation. And he began to study and practice with all of these great meditation masters who were already there in India at the time. And they taught him all these amazing techniques about how to develop this meditative stability. We can do the same. In fact, all my teachers have told me that we've had these meditative stabilizations countless times in other lifetimes. It's just we didn't do anything meaningful with them. They can be very peaceful states because we get the mind to this very subtle uh, focus that can be quite phenomenal from what I hear. I haven't, I haven't tasted that myself. One monk in our tradition, who some of you may have met, Venerable René Fusi, he's a great meditator, a Swiss French monk, um, and he uh, um, has done these long retreats. And he says when we even get to, there are nine levels that get you there, when we even get to the fourth level of these nine, it's already beyond anything you've experienced in this life in terms of the sort of inner peace that you can feel at that level. So this is a kind of, again, the next step in our training, we can, it's not that we do these, you know, one at a time, and when my morality is perfect, then I can engage in concentration, you know, because your morality is probably going to still be a little shaky here and there. You do all three of these trainings, but you won't have really good concentration until your morality is somewhat stable. But that concentration is something every one of us can develop. It just takes the discipline to be able to do that. Again, it means having a daily practice where we sit uh, do our meditative focus on some object that we've uh, chosen or that we've been provided through the kindness of a lama to meditate on that is a good object for stabilizing our awareness. And then we engage in all the, the various practices that get us there by being mindful, having this introspection that checks in to see the quality of our meditation, corrects things if needed, all these various things that are taught. Again, I'm not going to go into the full teachings on that. Uh, in the traditional Lam Rim, they're a pretty big part of the book. Uh, they're the teachings that are called how to attain calm abiding. Calm abiding is this first stage of having the mind very concentrated and focused. You can develop deeper concentrations from there, just as the Buddha did as Prince Siddhartha when he was going through all of this training. And you can make the mind very refined and make the mind very, very powerful in terms of the, the, um, the ability to penetrate is quite unique, unlike anything, again, we've had in this lifetime. So that's the second of the higher trainings. The third then is that you use that concentration to develop the training of wisdom. Wisdom is everything we're acquiring just sitting in the room here, but it's most especially the wisdom that understands the nature of reality. And this is what we're going through on the Wednesday night class um, in the looking at Nagarjuna's fundamental wisdom. These are the teachings that the Buddha gave in the Prajnaparamita, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, which spell out the clearest way to understand how things actually exist 
and how they lack this fictitious way of existing that we are adhering to, that we've been adhering to since beginningless time. We've had that ignorance that is a thinking things exist in this fictitious way without any beginning. And you might, that might sound like, well, then I'm never going to be free of it. If I've had it since beginningless time, I'll probably have it for, you know, eternity. Well, no, it can be combated through these three higher trainings, through morality, through concentration, and then through uniting that with this deep insight, what's called special insight into the nature of reality. So let me talk a little bit about this because I think it is important as I'm touching on it, not to just gloss it over and say, you know, for those of you who maybe haven't had as many teachings on emptiness, emptiness is taught in all the Buddhist traditions. There might be different approaches to it, might be different ways of, of presenting it. In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, it's very much grounded in the idea that this is something we can reason through. This is something you can know logically. It's something that you can actually come to understand yourself. Um, Whereas something like karma, karma is a, a really extremely hidden phenomenon, right? We, we don't know all the workings of karma. As I mentioned last week, we can't have that understanding that when something's happening to us, we can go, oh yeah, that's because three lifetimes ago, I said something bad to them and da, 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 and whatever. You know, we don't know that, right? We can't prove karma, but we can prove emptiness. Emptiness is a strange word because again, it's a negative word, right? It's not something that is affirming. So let's look at the affirming side of it first and then come to understand what emptiness is. And that's by looking at how things actually do exist so that we can make sure that we are combating this fictitious way that we think they exist. So if we look at any object, I don't know, what should I use today? I got my clothespin over there, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll retire my clothespin. Um, though the clothespin works really quite nicely. So, so we'll call this a chime ringer for the sake of, I don't know, maybe they have a, a word that they use for it in a, that's not chime ringer, I don't know, in the factory where they make these things. But this is what allows me, it has the function of being able to ring the chime there, right? I guess you could use it for a lot of different things. You could fake somebody out and think it's a lollipop or something like a kid, you know? Anyway, it'd be horrible. Um, so we have this phenomenon that we call chime ringer. Let's talk about the way in which it exists. And this is where we talk about this idea of dependent arising or dependent origination, that all things exist in dependence upon a variety of factors. The very first factor in terms of what gives rise to this chime ringer are the causes and conditions that led to it. It depends upon its causes and conditions. So just shout out, what are some of the causes and conditions that led to this chime ringer existing? Wood. wood, okay, because there's definitely wood in the dowel here that goes into the little ringer part. Lots of causes. Rain, good, because the rain needs, you need the rain to have the tree grow to get the wood from it. You need the dirt, you need the sun, you need lots of the things involved in getting the tree there. Anyone else in terms of causes and conditions? The workers, okay, there are people who work in a factory who do this, you know, uh, wood that's coming through and being cut into these pieces, shaped into these dolls. And then, of course, the uh, rubber part of it, kind of hard rubber uh, or plastic that is the, the ringer part of it that is formed. You even have the person who designed it, right? Might have not been a real you know, incredible work to design this. It wasn't that complicated. It's not like an iPhone or something. But nonetheless, you have people involved from that aspect too. You have a lot of people involved in the process of all of this, right? But we can also, again, go to just as we did with the tree and say the tree needed certain things in order to be a tree and, and give us the wood. We can also say those people needed many things to be able to design this and to produce it. We can talk about the food that they ate. We can talk about the sleep that they had. We can talk about, you know, all of what led to them being there to be able to produce these things. You can never find an end to all the causes and conditions that are involved in any object that we see in the world around us. Because there are, there are myriad, there's so many of them involved, not just at the level of what's directly involved, which could be kind of the, the, the plastic that is uh, made into this uh, ringer part, as well as the wood into the dowel, into the handle, but you know. It has to do with the, uh, the ringer as well. Yes, yes. The, the, yeah, the because, because you, you don't have a chime ringer unless you have a chime that is going to ring, right? You, know, you, you wouldn't design this unless you had this other piece, right? So there's an interdependence there as well. So you have lots of things that are involved. 
So we end up with the question, is there a chime ringer that exists independent of those causes and conditions? No, I mean, because it can't possibly exist independent of those. It depends upon those. So it's just speaking to something that, again, is not too hard for us to get our heads around, but already we speak, begin to see that things don't have an ability to stand on their own, to be independently existing, because they all arise. Everything that is produced in our world that is conditioned in this way arises from its causes and conditions. The second level of uh, dependent arising is in terms of parts. So here, again, you can find infinite parts if you go down to an infinitesimal level, you know, do all of the subatomic and sub-subatomic and whatever. I don't know where they go in terms of all this analysis now, quarks and subquarks and whatever. They can find infinite parts in terms of this. But let's just talk about the two main parts where you get some glue or something that's in there that's holding this in there. You have the, the let's just for the sake of this, call this the, the ringer part and the handle. So you have the ringer and the handle that makes up the total of the chime ringer. So is there a chime ringer that exists independent of those two parts? No, because again, if I only had the dowel, if I went into the store and I had saw this with that, I'd be like, well, I mean, it, it doesn't really do the trick, right? And if you saw just that with this, you'd be like, well, that's interesting, but how do I, <laughs> you know, you need a handle on it. So you have these two parts at least that the chime ringer depends upon. So we end up with the question once more, is there a chime ringer that exists independent of those parts? Totally separate from those parts without having depend to depend upon those parts? No. All right, then let's go to the third level. This is the subtlest level. And this is kind of the, the crux of these Prajnaparamita teachings is to get us to this degree all the way to this kind of very fine edge in terms of how things actually exist, but also then negating anything beyond that, anything more than that. So let's talk about those parts then now in this third way that we're going to explore dependent arising in terms of them being a basis for chime ringer. In this context, we have the basis for chime ringer in my hand, chime ringer is simply a label, a designation that we give to this, that we collectively, conventionally give to this object. We agree to call this chime ringer, but it doesn't have any chime ringerness from its own side. The parts in and of themselves are a basis for our designating chime ringer. And we can see that because once more in this part, we don't have chime ringer, right? You know, you wouldn't know if you saw all these dolls lying out on the table that they were going to be made into chime ringers. Maybe they're being made into, you know, tinker toys or something. Who knows? And you wouldn't know necessarily if you had that part that you have a chime ringer, right? You know, again, if you work in the factory, you're going to be quite used to seeing all these things and you're going to go, oh, yeah, these are all the, these are all the little chime ringer parts and these are the, this other part, the handle and whatever. You're going to be quite knowledgeable in using it. But in, there is no chime ringer from the side of that part. There's no chime ringer from the side of that part. But when they're all together here, suddenly we have chime ringer. Well, where does chime ringer come from? It doesn't come from the individual parts. It comes from our designating it as this. As I pointed out when I use the clothespin, and I can do it with this as well, if, if a dog was in the room, and you know, a dog that liked to chew, <laughs> and I threw this across the room and the dog went running over there and started chewing it. It'd have a good time chewing on this. It wouldn't like this so much, I don't think. Though, I don't know, they use plastic bones for dogs too. Um, I've stayed with people who have dogs that like to chew on these plastic, even little plastic shards all around or whatever. But, so maybe the dog would have a really, really good time chewing on this. And we'd be going, oh, Don, the dog is chewing up your chime ringer. And I'm like, mm, does the dog know it is chime ringer? Does the dog have any awareness of this as chime ringer? For the dog, it's chew toy. Whatever you know, their mental construct is of that object that they chew on, that they enjoy sinking their teeth into. So any being that relates to this is only going to relate to it as what we identify it as by being introduced to that idea, that construct, that mental way of formulating what we're going to call this object. Now, we don't just call anything chime ringer. I don't call this chime ringer, you know. You know, it could work as one to some degree, but it's not what we call chime ringer. We collectively, as I said, conventionally agree to call this chime ringer. We give it its identity 
in part because it serves the function of chime ringer. But who decides the function of chime ringer? That's also decided from our part, right? Because for the dog, it's not serving the function of chime ringer. It's a chew toy. It's something they're enjoying sinking their teeth into. So everything comes from the minds of beings in terms of there is a physical object that I'm holding in my hand that is the basis for what we call chime ringer, but there's no real chime ringer in my hand. There is no real chime ringer at all, but we think there's a real chime ringer. As soon as we see this, it seems to be emanating its chime ringerness, like, oh, I'm out here, you know, all self-established. That's what we're negating. We're negating anything that is more than nominal existence, anything more than just designated, merely imputed. Now we do that through language because we use the words chime ringer, just as we use language to communicate with each other. I couldn't be sitting in front of you talking about emptiness without language, but we're not simply talking about language. We're talking about mental constructs, you know, ways to relate to this because a dog doesn't have the language to refer to this as chew toy, but they will think of it as chew toy because that's how they're using it. That's the function it is serving for them whatever their way of referring to that is. Again, they don't have that language. So we're not simply talking about language, we're talking about the way in which we mentally construct the whole world around us, including the I, ourselves. You know, chime ringers are not problems in and of themselves when we're mistakenly thinking that they exist in this fictitious way. The problem is, is the I that relates to it, that starts thinking then, my chime ringer, you know, don't you take my chime ringer, Alexis, you know, we, we get really possessive about all these things, right? And we get angry at somebody who breaks our chime ringer or whatever the case might be. The I is the main one that we get involved in. So let's once more look at this idea of dependent arising in terms of the I, the person, because you too are a dependent arising and you too therefore are empty of existing in anything, any way more than being merely imputed, merely designated. I hate to break it to you, but you're all merely designated, merely imputed, nothing more than that, you know. Again, and we're getting kind of into this ontological thing, kind of trying to decide exactly how things exist. Why? Because if we think they exist in a fictitious way, then we have problems. Then we start relating to things in an unhealthy way. So let's look at the person or the I. Was there a question before? Yeah, Virginia. No, but I th it's, it's a good question. We can say that certainly this is what keeps sort of phenomenology being inexhaustible because there's always going to be new things created, right? I mean, look at objects that we take for granted now, like cell phones and what have you. You know, 30 years ago, these things didn't exist, right? maybe 20 years ago, I don't know. <laughs> I remember I was studying in Italy about 20 years ago and they had cell phones <laughs> everywhere it seemed. But anyway, maybe not the smartphones that we have now. Again, that's another new label, another way that people have designed something. So certainly when it comes to kind of manipulating, she said, so, so there's, there's obviously again, this whole process that happens in terms of how we identify objects in our world and that really being, again, the only way that we can find their identity. This is what we're getting down to the crux of this idea of emptiness is where does identity come from? We tend to think that identity comes from the side of the object, the thing that is being identified, but the identity actually comes from the identifier, the person who, or consciousness, that is de designating what things are, the function that they play and therefore some way of relating to them. Let me give one little story before I open it up to questions that I like to share when I talk about emptiness because I didn't realize it when I was seeing the film because I saw the film when I was quite young before I met Buddhism. But looking back on it, it's the very beginning of the film is about emptiness. And it's the film that's called The Gods Must Be Crazy, where 
there, at the very beginning of the film, there's a, a plane with two guys, South African dudes, who are kind of, one's drinking a bottle of Coca-Cola and drinking the, the Coca-Cola out of the yes. bottle. And he empties the bottle and he throws it out the plane and it goes, <laughs> falls in the Kalahari Desert. And one of the Bushmen of the Kalahari sees this coming down from the sky and goes over and he's kind of weary at first about what it is. And then he begins to use it. And, you know, his whole uh, community start to use it for all these various functions. They use it as like a, a grain pounder to, you know, make the grain more, finer. They use it to smooth out snake skins. They use it for all these various things. And they, they call it a gift from the gods. And of course, that's why the gods must be crazy. Why? Because they only gave them one, you know. And, <laughs> and so everybody's fighting over this, what we call a Coca-Cola bottle. But again, in this culture that was you know, on its own, not knowing the, the, you know, consumer culture that we have and Coca-Cola and what have you, they don't see it as Coca-Cola bottle at all, right? There's no awareness of Coca-Cola bottle. And of course, that's the, the trick for the audience is that we're all sitting there going, wow, look at these people using this Coca-Cola bottle in all these weird ways. It, it doesn't have any inherent existence as Coca-Cola bottle. There's nothing from the side of that glass object that is hollow with the, the hole at the top that they put all the Coca-Cola in. There's nothing that makes it into a Coca-Cola bottle other than our designating it as such. The Bushmen of the Kalahari see it in a totally different way. It's a gift from the gods that they can use for all these various things. You know, so anyway, that's the best part of the movie, I thought. The rest of the movie kind of went downhill from there in my mind. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's, it's about emptiness and about the fact that things don't have that identity until someone gives it that identity. And the identity of it as a gift from the gods for the Bushmen of the Kalahari is as valid as the designation of a Coca-Cola bottle for us in our consumer culture that are relating to it in that way. They both are valid designations, just like the dog seeing this as a chew toy is as valid as me seeing it as a chime ringer. But when we see the dog chewing it, we go, oh my God, the dog's chewing your chime ringer. Well, no, the dog's chewing a chew toy. <laughs> to the in a dog's mind, it has no identity as chew toy or chime ringer from its own side. It has to do with our awareness, our consciousness, giving it that identity. So let me open it up to questions and see, and then before I, I talk about the I. No questions. You all got it. You're all like <laughs> realized beings already. <laughs> yes, Asia. Uh-huh. Mm. This is a big debate, and a lot of schools of Buddhist thinking would say that there is a reification of, of consciousness or awareness, because that's the bucket in which all of this is happening, in a sense. But nonetheless, in, in the thinking of this final view, which is what we're studying on Wednesday night, the middle way view, they say that even consciousness, you cannot find any phenomenon that doesn't have this emptiness, that isn't empty. You cannot find any phenomenon that is inherently existent, intrinsically existent, because even consciousness is merely designated, is merely labeled. There's a phenomenon that is, again, we can talk about the moments of mind that consciousness is designated to, we're never denying that there's something that is the basis for that. But mind is simply a label. Consciousness is simply a label that we give to that stream of awareness, all those various mental moments. And even any one of those individual mental moments is simply designated on the basis of something that is happening that we can experience, but nonetheless doesn't have any identity from its own side. Again, we're not, it doesn't all become like pea soup. By virtue of knowing that things are empty, it doesn't mean that that things don't have any differentiation whatsoever. In terms of their emptiness, there is no differentiation. That's why we can say things are of one taste at that level, because there is no difference between the emptiness of a Coca-Cola bottle, the emptiness of a chime ringer, the emptiness of Don. All of them are empty in the same way because they all lack inherent existence. They all are merely designated, merely imputed. But the diversity of phenomena arise nonetheless because there are different causes and conditions that give rise to different phenomena. 
So we can say that this is kind of the way that we talk about the two truths. We'll get into this. We did a little bit of this on Wednesday night. There's the ultimate truth, which is the final nature of all phenomena, their emptiness, their lack of inherent existence. The second truth is their conventional truth, which is the fact that they do exist in dependence upon these factors. They're dependent arising. They exist in dependence on their causes and conditions. They exist in dependence upon their parts. In the end, they exist most subtly in dependence upon our designating them as such, our conceptual designation of the variety of things that exist. Even though consciousness is the designating agent, it doesn't mean that it has some reified existence. It too is merely designated, merely imputed. Now, again, how you would prove that is you go in and you start analyzing and seeing whether you can find something to be real in the way that you think it's real. Can you find something to exist from its own side in that way? Let's, let's do the self and then we'll, we'll, we'll maybe explore this a little bit. Consciousness is one of the trickiest things to work with. And it's, it's said to be, this is why this technique that's called Mahamudra is about analyzing using the basis of the mind, consciousness to discern emptiness. But it's, it too is an empty phenomenon. It too lacks inherent existence. So when we talk about an I or a self, there is the basis for the I and there is the label I then, according to what we just discussed, right? So there is the basis, which in the case of a human uh, person is the human body and the human consciousness. There's nothing more here than that. Mind and matter, you know, form and the mental components, all the various mental processes that are going on. Of course, this is why the Buddha at his in his time refuted this idea of there being a soul, some other sort of aspect of our being, what the Vedic traditions call Atman, so that there, there's anatman, there is no, no Atman. There is nothing here that is not, that is sort of separate on its own, apart from the mind and body, able to be distinguished apart from the mind and body. Instead, you have the mind and the body, and it being designated or thought of as I. So in that way, we can say that the I arises from causes and conditions because the various components of the I arise from causes and conditions. Your mind arises from previous moments of mind. Your form, physical form that you have arose from the two cells of your parents that united in the womb of your mother that began multiplying and eventually became the body that has the continuity to the body that you currently possess. It's not the same body, but it is the continuity of all of that matter that is the body that you currently possess. So you arose from causes and conditions. You also, of course, of course, rose from the karma that created this life that you have and all the other things that fed into your having this human existence. You also arise from your parts, depend upon your parts. There's Don's body and Don's mind. And then you can talk about all the parts of Don's body and all the parts of Don's mind. And you can get down once more into infinite parts that are involved in all of this. And then finally, you can talk about Don being merely imputed, that there is no Don from the side of this stuff that's in front of you. Don is a label we give to this collection of stuff. My parents gave me that label when I was quite young. It was named after my uncle Donald, who uh, died, unfortunately, um, on an operating table anyway. Um, but anyway, that's who I was named after. You know, my father wanted to name me Donald. And so I have that name. Not, I don't use Donald. Only my father used Donald. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I'm merely designated, merely imputed. There's no real Don here. There's no real I here, which is how I think of this. Of course, I think of it as Don, but I think of it as I that strong sense of self or person. I think there's something more substantial to me than that, that somehow there's something real here. There is consciousness, going back to Asia's question, there is consciousness that has, it's the thread that goes through all of my existences. And that's why our karma is important to attend to is because you are the recipient of the acts you did in the past. The karma you created in the past ripens into your experiences now. What you're creating now ripens into future experiences. But in the future, I'm not Don. I don't know who I'll be in the next life. You know, whatever I get designated by whoever, you know, gives birth to me or whatever. All of that process continues. The consciousness goes through all of this. But there's no real Don. There's no real I. I'm going to always think of things as being I because that's the ingrained thought that I have relating to my consciousness together with some sort of physical matter as being I. Now that I is going to be a different person in the next life. It was a different person in the prior life. There's no 
real, substantially existent I in any of this. There's nothing that I cannot locate that is the I. So let's go looking for it and see if we can actually find the I. If in this moment you exist intrinsically, inherently, then you should be able to find the true referent of that. When we think I so strongly, and you can think about those times when you have had strong emotion in your life, Maybe you've even been in you know, one of these accidents that was really close and you thought you were going to die. The sense of I was like really prominent because you thought you were going to go out of existence. Or maybe it's just a milder experience like being falsely accused by somebody. They said, you know, who took the last cookie? I'll bet you did. And you're like, no, I didn't take the last cookie. Don't look at me. You know, I'm not the one. Right. There's always a sense of I that has some prominence at those times. Let's go look and see if there's a real referent of that. When we think I in those ways, is there something we can point to and say, ah, there's the I? Well, what are the choices in terms of where we would find that I? The most likely choice is we're going to find it somewhere here. I don't think I'm in the kitchen right now, right? <laughs> you know, I think I'm here. Why? Because the mind and the body are here. This basis for the I is here. So this is the most likely place to look for the I. But to make sure that we have, you know, gotten rid of all possibilities, we have to say it's either going to be one with the same as this mind and body, or it's going to be different from it. Those are what's called a dichotomy. There's nothing that is a third possibility. If I say, you know, Judy's either at the center or she's somewhere else. Well, if Judy exists, <laughs> keep existing, Judy, um, then she's either at the center or she's somewhere else. Can she be a third place? No, because somewhere else includes everything that is not here. So either the I is here together with all this stuff in this prominent way, this real I that we think exists, or it's somewhere totally different. So let's go looking in both of those places. Let's start picking apart what's going on here in this cushion and can I find a real I here? Well, is my real I my body? We tend to identify people by their body, right? We say, oh, there's Virginia and oh, there's Mark, you know, whatever. We identify them because we see their physical form. We don't see their consciousness, though we assume they're conscious, you know. <laughs> we, we, you know, just kind of impute that idea of Mark on the basis of Mark's body appearing to us. But is Mark equivalent to his body? Am I equivalent to my body? Well, then I'd be my body in all ways. There would be, and mind is not body. So we'd, we'd exclude mind ever being, do we, do we think of ourselves? Do we have some thoughts about ourselves? We can entertain those without even thinking about the body, right? You know, there can be sort of a separation of a sense of I from the body. Sometimes we strongly identify with the body. You know, if you stub your toe or you're dealing with some you know, physical problem, the concreteness of the I being the body feels very real. But we would have to say that the I cannot, the body cannot be the real I because if it was, then it would exclude the mind from having any relationship at all to the eye. You would only be your body. Let's go to the, the mind and kind of see the consequences of that. If I say I'm only my mind, Don is a mind, a consciousness, well then it wouldn't make sense for people to identify me on the basis of my body, right? Because there's no mind that they're seeing. I'm not seeing you know, Mark's mind when I identify that as Mark. I'm seeing his body. And we too also have moments when we do strongly identify with the body. If we were only mind, we couldn't possibly be identifying with ourselves as the body. So, so we have these two separate pieces of our existence that are mind and body that are interrelated, obviously. Again, mind consciousness, this non-material phenomenon that is having moments going back without any beginning, moments going forward without any end. And then we have the physical component, which interacts with this. And even in this human body, we have the complexity of the, the physical matter that is in our brains and our central nervous system and all of this that allows us to experience human, human existence. Um, all of that is operating in tandem. But those are two separate phenomena. We cannot find a real eye to exist discreetly as mind or discreetly as body. Well, then you might say, but oh, the eye is the collection of those. We even sometimes use the term mind-body complex, your mind-body complex. We've got several mind-body com complexes here today. <laughs> that sounds strange, right? But that's kind of how we think. We think there's, we're this collection of stuff that's going on here. That's the real I. But you've already identified two things that are involved in that, right? A mind-body complex. So there have to be at least two eyes then here. 
you know, do you think of yourself as two people? There's the I that is the body, the I that is the mind. No, we think of a unitary self that is here together with all of this. There is no real I that can be equivalent to the mind-body complex because the mind-body complex by its very definition is not unitary. It's more than one thing. So you would either be two eyes or you'd only have one base, one thing that is the basis. Because what we're trying to find is something that is the true referent, that is speaking to that sense of unitary I that we adhere to so strongly, that we're driven by in so much of our lives. Not just those times when, yeah, we're feeling threatened or falsely accused. It's more prominent then, but it plays out in very subtle ways when we get attached to things, when we have aversion to things. All of these are patterns that are incited by the sense of I that we're clinging to. So this is the analysis that, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, we go into in great detail. I'm not going to, you know, belabor it anymore by going into a, um, more complex things. On Wednesday night, we're going to be, on when, this coming Wednesday, we'll be getting into chapter 18 of Nagarjuna, where he investigates the self and goes into this, you know, is, what's the nature of the self? Is it, is it real in the way that we think it is? Lama Zopa Rinpoche actually uses that when he talks about this false sense of self. He calls it the real I. Now he's not, by using that and negating that through emptiness, we say there is no real I. That he doesn't mean that there's no reality at all, because once more, there is conventional reality. But conventional reality is really very, very slight. Rinpoche says it's almost as if the I doesn't exist. It's almost as if things don't exist because they exist simply by designation, simply by conceptualization. There's a basis, but then what we designate it as is entirely from our own side. Coca-Cola bottle, gift from the gods, you know, whatever it is that we are identifying. That basis doesn't kind of, you know, alter in some ways. It's our designation of it that is dependent upon our existence, our culture, our whatever. Any questions on this? I feel like I've been talking a lot today, but I don't want to all just go blah, blah, blah. I mean, why, why I felt to spend you know, a little bit more time on this is because even though in the traditional teachings, this is not taught until the great scope, there's not much emphasis in the next uh, set of uh, verses there, those lines, in terms of working on emptiness and your knowledge of emptiness. It is central to the Buddhist teachings that you have to realize this wisdom that negates this fake sense of self in regard to your, the person, you, as well as you know, anything that you identify and that you give that level of identity to. We have to see that all of them lack that. All of them are empty. It's crucial to do that in order to attain your own liberation, which is what this verse is speaking to. In order to attain freedom from your suffering once and for all, you have to have that realization. Without that realization, you know, you will be able to lessen your suffering because we've already talked about means of lessening our suffering by not committing all the non-virtuous actions, performing more virtuous actions, also by maybe not having our attachment and our aversion so active. You can lessen those with what we call temporal antidotes. You know, like your anger, for example. Sometimes we get anger, angry at people who are doing something um, through the force of their own ignorance, through the force of their own delusion. Well, if we start recognizing that, we might not get so angry because we see them maybe as an object of compassion instead of anger because they're under the control of their own crazy minds. You know, we look at you know, whoever it is in, in our world, we can see that delusion is operative in every part of our, it's even operative in religion and Buddhism. I mean, people are still together with delusion. So you're still gonna have people acting out of delusion. Well, why get angry at them? if they're under the control of their own crazy states of mind the same way that we are, right? So, yeah, maybe. I had a question. Um, so if we decide to meditate and do it as a med meditation exercise to find the eye or not find the eye, right. we're not going to come up with anything. But mm -hmm. it stays kind of an intellectual um, sure. process. So is what we're after to realize that or to mm -hmm. just just to keep doing the intellectual process until we realize it very good so yes it does start off as an intellectual exercise that we it doesn't hit home mm -hmm. in the way that we ideally want to that's why again we need the three higher trainings we need not just the morality but then of course the concentration which allows us to be able to stay single-pointedly focused on emptiness the wisdom which is the third 
you know, higher training, you won't be able to really alter the nature of your mind, get it to that degree of having that realization without deep concentration. I know that some Buddhist traditions might say you have these sort of spontaneous realizations of emptiness. Well, maybe if you've done all the work in a prior life, you might have that good fortune of having it be more spontaneous. In Tibetan, <clears throat> excuse me, in Tibetan Buddhism, the approach is, is that you begin to understand emptiness intellectually. And you go through a process of, first, you kind of hear teachings like this for the first time or second time, or maybe even several times, and you just kind of assume that there's some truth to that because it sounds like it might be true. Then you have to eventually do your own investigation. You have to sit with these teachings, do the meditative uh, analysis, uh, realize it at that level, but it's still conceptual at that level. It's still what we call an inferential realization. Then eventually, through the force of your meditation on emptiness, you achieve what's called a direct realization, which is where in our conceptual minds, we're always thinking of things with some idea. All of what I've been saying to you today, you've been forming ideas in your own head, what we call a mental image of emptiness. Just like I could say, think about your own mother of this life. Hopefully most of you know your mother. I mean, someone who raised you, if it wasn't the birth mother that you had, you can bring an image to mind, right? That's a mental image. That's your conceptual mind working. If your mother was here in front of you, then you would see the direct image of your mother. You'd see you know, her body appearing to you and have the imprint of her face and through your visual consciousness, be able to say, oh, there's my mother, right? But you can still do that through your conceptual con consciousness by virtue of these mental images. You're gonna have a mental image of emptiness for a while because you need to create that idea of what it is on the basis of these teachings. At some point in your concentration, when you develop deep awareness of it, the idea of emptiness falls away and you know emptiness directly. That's when like the, that really hits home in terms of there's no reversing of that. They call that level in some of the practice, some of the traditions stream enter because you've entered the stream that takes you out of samsara because you've actually begun the process of unraveling all of that at the deepest level in terms of that type of wisdom is what we're driving towards. That's really the, the, the culmination of these three higher trainings is to develop that wisdom. But for most of us, it's only gonna impact on a very superficial level because it's only an idea in our heads and we can apply it at times. You know, we can begin to use that. Maybe the, like the antidote I was using around the people who make you angry, that's one where we, we try to replace our anger with some compassion, some love for that person because we see how they're tortured by their own crazy minds. To see it through the lens of emptiness means to negate this strong sense of self that is being attacked at that time. The, the even negate the sense of those words and that person being so real. You know, we, we are imbuing all of that with a level of reality that is totally fictitious. So we have to apply it where we can, but you're right. It's not gonna feel like it's really hitting home until we have a deeper realization of emptiness. That's what these Arya beings have had that I mentioned earlier. They've known emptiness directly in that way. And again, you're gonna, it's gonna be, you're gonna be hard pressed to get someone to admit to this. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, he says, I'm just a simple Buddhist monk. I have a little knowledge of emptiness, but not so much, you know. <laughs> so, you know, even His Holiness, who we can assume has this realization is going to be very modest and humble in regard to that. But, those are kind of who we want to rely upon. That's why I always encourage whenever I teach about emptiness, which I'm going to do right now in terms of this, what I'm saying, is to hear teachings on emptiness from great masters, from His Holiness, from Lama Zopa Rinpoche, from others who you might assume have that realization. They're going to teach it in a very different way because all I have is my intellectual understanding from my years of study in Italy and talking about it and meditating on my own. But no, no great shakes. You can take for granted when I say I'm just a simple Buddhist practitioner, that's it. You know, no great realizations here. You know, there's no man behind the curtain or anything, you know. <clears throat> so anyway, this is the idea that we want to engage in these three higher trainings. Even at this level, if you want to attain your own liberation, want to be free from your own suffering once and for all, you absolutely have to go through this process of calming your behavior in terms of having good morality, stopping harming others, which by virtue of that harms ourself. Uh, then you want to engage in deep concentration, these meditative practices that help to stabilize the mind, 
developing calm abiding uh, as it's instructed in the text, but even going beyond that if you wish to develop deeper concentration. And then third, do the special insight, the investigation into emptiness, you know, repeatedly analyzing again and again and again so that you can bring that wisdom into your meditation. It's what we call analytical meditation in this tradition. You have stabilizing meditation and analytical meditation. They're both forms of meditation and they're both necessary parts of our path. But if we don't have you know, the, the stable mind, it's very hard to make the analytical mind go anywhere. We can get it at an intellectual level, but it's not gonna hit home. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of things that can contribute to it, you know, to kind of give us that, that loosening up of that sense of self that we are so strongly invested in. You say, of course, that's one of the things that makes death so painful is because we've lived with this idea, identity of who we are for so long that we're, all of this is being shed. Everything that we've come to identify as who we are is going to have to be let go. And so we don't like that. And of course, that's why, as we talked about in the Wednesday night class and looking at the 12 links, at the end of this life, you're going to have strong craving and grasping to be embodied again, to kind of hold on to all of that because we don't like the idea of non-existence. Well, and Buddhism isn't teaching non-existence. It's not existence of a particular way that we exist. But as I said earlier, the way that we actually exist is so very subtle. But if we fall into that extreme, which wasn't what you were talking to, but it's another part of it to be attentive to, what we call this extreme of nihilism, thinking that then I don't exist at all, you don't exist at all, nothing exists at all, my karma doesn't exist at all. I mean, you can go to these extremes that make it really not good results because we do have to be attentive to everything that exists in the space of understanding that it doesn't exist in the way that it appears, in the way that we think it does. Because this is one of the other factors that plays a role in this. I didn't introduce this as part of today, but at, through the force of our having this adherence to all of these things as existing intrinsically, through the force of my conception of them existing intrinsically, inherently from their own side, they appear that way. I have these subtle imprints on my mind that cause things to appear as if they have their own self-existence. They're identified out there on their own. So we get reaffirmed in that. You know, this is a hard puzzle to undo because the world appears this way and we agree to it appearing that way. But we don't get that this is an ignorant mind because it, although it appears this way, it doesn't exist this way at all. That's why we have these wonderful little analogies that are in the verse that we recited at the beginning, right? In verse page 76 of the prayer book. Some of these are alluding to the impermanence of phenomena, that things are changing, but others are referring to the fact that things often don't appear in the way that they exist. For example, um, a dream, an illusion. You know, we have these things that appear to us in our dream. Uh, I like using this analogy of the dream a lot because the Buddha used it a lot. These are from the Vajrakutta Sutra, that, that verse in particular. In your dream, everything appears as real as it does in your waking life. If you're dreaming like I dream, I mean, I don't have lucid dreaming. I can count on my hand, one hand, the number of times I've had lucid dreaming in this life. Usually I'm caught up in my dreaming and it's all just appearing to me and I'm buying into that reality. And then when I wake up, even though I might've had great emotions on the basis of everything that was happening in my dream, it's all gone in a sense because there's, there was no real uh, dream object. The dream object was just an appearance. Well, it's a similar thing in regard to our waking life. Everything is appearing to be real in a way that is fictitious. It doesn't really exist that way. We have to recognize that it's sort of a dream that we're in. It's not a dream. It's like a dream. I mean, otherwise, again, we get and fall into this kind of nihilistic bent. It isn't a dream. You know, it's not row, row, row your boat. Life is but a dream. You know, <laughs> it isn't a dream, but it's like a dream. Because just in the way that we are adhering to reality in the dream and we get all these emotions on the basis of it, we're adhering to reality in our waking life. And we have all these emotions on the basis of it. And those afflictive emotions are pretty serious because they're causing all of our problems. If we were able to wake up, which is what the root word Buddha means, the awakened one, we were able to wake up to the reality of what's actually happening, we would no longer get caught up in it. Just like if you were lucidly dreaming, you'd be going, oh, here comes that you know, guy with a machete at me or something, but I know it's just a dream object. I don't, I'm not gonna be harmed, right? Now you might think, well, what if a guy's coming to you with a machete <laughs> in the real life? You know, 
get out of the way. His Holiness always says, run away, you know, don't, <laughs> do what you can to get out of it. There's some conventional existence to that that's different than the dream, right? Because what happens in your dream, you don't wake up and you've got all these, you know, gaping wounds on your body because the guy with the machete, you know, hit you in your dream or something. No, instead, you know, you, we, we know that dream reality is not the same as waking reality. It's an analogy. In our waking life, it's similar to the dream state because we're buying into reality in that way. We think reality exists in a way that is fictitious, that is not in line with how it actually exists. So I don't know if I muddied the waters by throwing all of that in there or not, but, but that's another factor playing the role. Like when we first identified something, and I don't know, I mean, I can't recall the first chime ringer I ever saw in my life, but somebody must have identified it, or maybe I self-identified it at some degree. But we, we first had an appearance of just the basis. It didn't have any identity to it at all, right? Because we haven't, haven't given that identity to it. Other people may have, but it's, again, it's, it's contingent upon my identifying is that for it to exist as a real chime ringer for me. So the first thing was that the basis appeared. And then I identified it, you know, and maybe it was just sitting here on its own. And I was like, Oh, Susanna, what is that? And you'd say, oh, it's, it's a chime ringer. The chime isn't here at the moment, you know? So I didn't really understand what it was. I go, oh, okay. But once I know that it's a chime ringer, then it's like chime ringer and this basis merge into one. Its identity as chime ringer m becomes one with this basis. And it appears back to me as if it's got chime ringer all over it. I can't ever see it as separate from chime ringer because the label becomes one with the basis. That's what this ignorance is, is adhering to, is the fact that when it appears back to me, it, it doesn't seem to be something separate. In fact, the label chime ringer and what's in my hand are two different phenomena. Related phenomena, one's the label, one's that the basis to be labeled. But they merge and seem as if they're one through the force of these imprints on my mind. I have this false appearance. Just like in the dream, things appear and I think they're as real as in my waking life. Does it make some sense? So this is a huge topic. I mean, I've spent most of today talking about it, but it's big. You know, emptiness is not something that, unless you've got some great realizations from your prior life, it's not something that you get exposed to once and you go, ah, I get it. It's fine. You know, I understand. Um, it's something you're going to have to struggle with, perhaps, and really fine-tune your own understanding. But, you know, there are, this tradition has a wealth of teachings to support that. And know that even when Geshe Sherab returns in um, uh, next year in May, he's going to be going into the special insight section, I believe. I think he finished the Columbiting section. Did he not? Uh, those of you who were attending his Wednesday night class. Because the, the culmination of the Lam Rim that's taught uh, in that, that course, uh, the stages of the path, are these two trainings. A training in calm abiding or concentration, and then the training in this higher wisdom of emptiness, uh, special insight. Anyway, he will be going into that. And that's a wonderful teaching to go through because he, Lama Tsongkhapa in that text goes into how to clearly delineate the two truths to make sure that we don't fall into some erroneous views, that we actually find that middle way, uh, that perfect uh, pathway between these two extremes of kind of thinking things don't exist and continuing to think that they exist in this real way, this fictitious way that we have been holding them to. So... No, any other questions? It just kind of blow everybody out of the water or anything? Or, I, mean, I don't think my teachings are that powerful, but the topic is powerful. This is a powerful topic. This is really the ultimate antidote. This is what we ultimately have to apply. But don't think that this is for everybody right from the get-go. You know, if, if there are other ways, again, to practice, as I said, these more temporal antidotes with objects of attachment, it's seeing that they also are impermanent, that they don't last. We get so attached to so many things, you know, have them in our lives. But everything you have in your life right now that is physical, that is an object of attachment for you, you're going to have to let go of at the end, right? You can't take any of it with you, hate to say, you know. So that impermanence should already lessen, lessen some of our attachment. But even the fact that we're not, when the mind of attachment's operative, we're not really even seeing the unpleasant aspects of those objects. We're adhering to them as if they're totally wonderful, totally delightful. But nothing is totally wonderful and totally delightful in our conditioned world. There's always faults, always sides to it that we're not seeing. So again, there's lots of ways to loosen up some of these uh, afflictions, these disturbing thought obscurations as they're described here. But the final way is through the wisdom realizing emptiness. All right. 
No other questions. Okay. Well, I'll be hanging around for a little bit after class if you had a question you would like to ask one-on-one. -on -one. So this is, I think we've pretty much done this first, and we can go on in the next class to look at um, the uh, great capable being. Uh, as I said, you're welcome to use this practice. You can even go beyond what we've studied here. Um, there are, again, a number of pages to this practice. When you do it in the morning, it doesn't have to take a real long time, but it's important that you bring to mind these what I've been talking about and Rinpoche's teachings on these as well that I've been trying to pass along so that you can have more meaning to what you're saying. So this doesn't, just doesn't become something you recite by rote or something. You can memorize this in a very short period of time, but you want to be able to say, yes, you know, when it says there to continuously follow day and night, the path of the three types of precious trainings, the principal method for becoming free from samsara, that you then kind of do it in, an inquiry to yourself. To what degree am I practicing? good morality, you know, developing concentration, fine-tuning my wisdom, because that's the heart of the path to liberation. Okay. All right, let's do some prayers then to wrap up today. Let's go to page 246, and we'll recite these nice verses, wonderful verses from Master Shanti Deva's Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. Again, as it says there in the little box, this is uh, one of His Holiness's favorite dedications. Before we recite this, though, let's bring to mind all those beings that we are making strong dedications for in particular. You know, earlier we were talking about having gratitude for people, but all of those beings, obviously, that we are grateful for, whether they be our friends, whether they are complete strangers to us, or whether they're even people we might identify as enemies or difficult people, we want to be dedicating for all of them. But there are some in those, you know, groups that we might have a closer relationship with and bring to mind those that you know that are experiencing some level of obstacles in their life, obstacles to their well-being, what have you, or bring to mind those who have illness, who are dealing with challenges to their health. Also, we can bring to mind those that we know who have died recently or who might even be actively dying at this point. And whoever it is that we're bringing to mind, think in particular about these beings benefiting as we recite these dedication prayers. But then, as usual, try to extend this to all beings, to think that all beings will be free from suffering through what we've done here today by virtue of our becoming enlightened for their sake. So let's recite these verses now. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy, by virtue of my merits, may no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food, May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth. Those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Turn back a page and we'll do that uh, prayer for his holiness. That's a paper clip to that page. And then on the opposite side, we'll do the prayer for Lama Zopa Rinpoche. As we recite these, think that we're creating the causes for not just these two teachers to have uh, good health and long lives and for their wishes to be fulfilled, but the same for all spiritual teachers, all spiritual guides in this world. You know, even whatever tradition they're from, if they're involved in helping others to find peace, to find happiness, to practice a path of morality, what have you, then we pray for their good health and long lives and that we and others may never be parted from perfect guides. 
the wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, to the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjuna's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three jewels, Savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Thank you all so much and have a good week. And thank you all who were online with us today. So, okay. <laughs>